Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to event sourcing and real-world applications. Uh, I'm James Smith. I'm a development manager at Gaslight uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I love working there because I get to work with great people uh, on a really good variety of projects in uh, Elixir in a wide range of domains. And sometimes things are hard and you just gaze outside the window uh, and contemplate life's hard questions like, who really is the good boy? Um, uh, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say we're currently hiring. Uh, so if, you, if the kind of projects I'm talking about today or uh, I've talked about in the past are interesting to you, um, come talk to me or uh, apply at the link above. Love to get a chance to work with more awesome people. So, um, so we had a client approach us uh, to help them rebuild uh, their current legacy auction platform. Um, they uh, were really interested in the real-time capabilities that Phoenix and Elixir brought. And um, they, uh, a little bit about them, uh, their name is Ocean Connect Marine. Uh, they're in the bunkering industry. Uh, and if you're like me, you didn't, I wasn't familiar with that term, bunkering. Uh, it's actually the process of supplying uh, fuel, uh, gas, and oil to ships uh, through barges. Um, so I was pretty excited about this. Uh, we were going to get to help supply thousands of metric tons of gasoline to ships uh, with Elixir. I mean, what could go wrong, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, but we were a little unfamiliar with the term uh, and, and the domain. So one of the thir first things we did uh, was try some design exercises to understand the domain a little bit. And um, in the wake of Phoenix 1.3 uh, and the introduction of context, uh, we had been talking a lot about D&D, everybody, D&D, uh, &D, yeah. yes, I had been talking a lot about Dungeons and Dragons, but nobody else. No, uh, domain-driven design, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, we'd been talking about it at the local user group um, in Cincinnati, and Mark Winholtz, uh, one of our local developers and a mentor of mine, uh, introduced us uh, in one meeting to a design exercise that I had never done before called event storming. Uh, so after the Elixir meetup, uh, I started researching it a little more and uh, event, uh, about event storming and found a really great book uh, called Event Storming by uh, Alberto Brand... I'm going to mess this up. Brand Brandolini, I believe. Uh, it's really great. I, I recommend checking it out. But... Um, we uh, decided that event storming might be a really good design exercise to help us understand the uh, bunkering industry a little better and the uh, auction platform that we were building. Um, so we met with our clients and uh, went through the event storming exercise and started breaking things down uh, into domain events, uh, commands, uh, and um, commands were uh, events that transform state and maybe produce other events and policies. And it was really helpful. Uh, it helped us understand uh, and break apart the, the problem space uh, really well. Um, and we started to think that maybe uh, this project actually would work really well for an event-oriented architecture, um, which eventually led us down the path to event sourcing. Um, so what is event sourcing? Uh, event sourcing is a pattern. Uh, where every change to the state of your application is stored in an event that represents a fact of something that occurred in your system. Uh, the idea is that at any time, the entire state of your application can go away and be rebuilt and reconstructed from these events or facts. Uh, it's even possible to reconstruct state and uh, from past, um, rec reconstruct past state uh, from these events. And, um, if you have done or looked at event sourcing at all, um, you'll probably find a lot of talks by Greg Young. Uh, he is like the leading authority, I think, on event, uh, event sourcing. And uh, what he likes to say a lot is that you probably do event sourcing or have interacted with event sourcing every day and just don't realize it. Um, so, uh, and, and usually it's in the real world. Uh, for instance, accounting. 
uh, when, it, when you're filling out a ledger, uh, accountants typically uh, will tell you that they don't work in pencil, they only work in pen. Uh, that's because each transaction is immutable, right? Uh, it's a thing that occurred, a debit and a credit. And at any, any point you can reconstruct, like your bank account, you can reconstruct your checking account's balance based on debits and credits, right? Um, Another, another uh, common uh, event sourcing uh, application you use all the time uh, is version control. Uh, Git stores every commit in a ref log, and it's a diff between the previous state and the next state. And you can reconstruct and branch off from there uh, using all of those commits, right? Um, so why event sourcing? Um, I mentioned we were thinking that it might work out really well for our application, uh, and the reason why is that um, we, uh, we had some requirements early on uh, that really made sense, uh, like auditing. Uh, it was really important when uh, you're dealing with large transactions uh, to make sure that in an auction, um, the auction was conducted fairly. So there was a, a common practice of auditing um, the the uh, order of events that occurred in the auction and making sure that those were correct. Um, the other thing was, uh, this wasn't really our first rodeo. We had worked on an auction site several years ago uh, in the estate sales industry. And I remembered some of the pain we felt. Um, kind of like the guy falling off the horse there. Um, one of them was it was really difficult, I remember, to reconstruct the state of an auction uh, and, and use it either in for testing or debugging. And uh, the idea that we could rebuild an auction at any point uh, based on the, the events that occurred and use that for troubleshooting was really appealing. Um, so there's a lot of existing libraries uh, for doing event sourcing. Uh, in Elixir. Uh, Commanded is the most common one that I see a lot uh, by Ben Smith. Uh, it's really large and full-featured uh, and goes heavily into CQRS and has a lot of good features for routing your events to multiple aggregates. Um, Maestro is another one uh, that I was introduced to by Chris Keithley uh, and I believe Neil Mean worked on. Um, I, I need to give a shout out to Chris. He actually uh, when uh, I was talking about the auction application I was building um, with him, he jumped on a call with me for like an hour and walked me through um, Maestro and some of the things that it does. And it was really helpful. Um, and he's done a lot around ordering of events and I recommend checking uh, his library out a lot. Uh, another one is Event Bus. Uh, and there are several others. There's a lot of event-oriented architecture libraries in Elixir. Um, but how did, how did we get started? Um, well, <laughs> we kind of took a DIY approach. Um, I was looking at a lot of the libraries and it actually seemed like our problem space was a little simple. Um, and I wanted, before I jumped in and decided to use a library, I wanted to decide how, I wanted to understand the problem a little better and, and solve a contextual uh, solution, a, a contextual problem with a contextual solution. Um, so we started out pretty simply, uh, and we had, you know, some false starts, some bent nails. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the mistakes we made, some of the successes we had, and um, where we ended up. Um, so some of the mistakes we made early on. Um, so Elixir makes it really easy to uh, have lots of processes uh, that do things asynchronously, and when you, it can be exciting at first, and your, your inclination is to uh, make everything async, right? Uh, so we started out with something a little like this. Uh, we had a user that would enter commands uh, that would get stored, uh, sent on to an auction store and a bid list, and um, then uh, we also had timers were really important in our application, so we had an auction timer that was running in the background, and the state of the auction would get updated, and it would update the channel and, and uh, notify the user. But there's a problem with this. Can 
everybody see the issue? Uh, so you have the auction timer that starts at a time and ends at a specific time. And the problem is, is that your commands being sent to the bid list, your user thinks, oh, my, my bid was processed, but the timer is exited and it hasn't updated the auction store yet. Uh, so you actually have an asynchronous issue and that's no good. <laughs> um, that, that was challenging at first. Uh, and what we really had to start thinking about was um, how, how we were going to crash appropriately. Uh, so we, we started with something like this, um, similar to the diagram here, where we had an auction supervisor and a bid supervisor and a timer supervisor. And this is great because like, everything's separately supervised. And if it crashes, the supervisor is going to restart it and everything's going to be cool. Um, but we had to actually think about like, what does it mean for our auction service to be available? If you know, the bid service goes down and we can't accept bids, but the timer is still running, that's not fair, right? Uh, the auction's gonna end. So we actually ended up with a single supervisor uh, for all of the processes that need to be running in order for an auction to be available. Um, so um, it looked a little like this. Uh, we had a, a single auction uh, supervisor that created multiple auction supervisors. It was a dynamic supervisor. Um, and that would create a single auction supervisor that started all of its necessary children. Um, so. It was, it was really tempting to be very asynchronous to start with, and we had to kind of rein that back a little bit. Um, the other issue that we ran into pretty frequently that isn't necessarily event sourcing, um, an event sourcing problem, but dealing with events that were time related. Uh, an auction starts at a certain time and it ends at a certain time. And, um, Early on, that we ran into several challenges with that. Some of them wasn't necessarily um, event sourcing related. If you saw Tim and Bailey's talk yesterday, uh, they talked about some of the UX patterns that you can use to make real-time information more consumable by users and ways you can uh, keep your users' trust and not erode that. Um, so showing how much time was left in each auction uh, in real time was really important. But we discovered a couple things. Um, so one of our um, clients was in London, and uh, he was on a Windows machine. And his clock uh, on his computer wasn't being synced with NTP, uh, Network Time Protocol. And so it was actually losing minutes. And um, this was something we ran into a few more times since then. So we actually had to. Uh, sync each client with our server um, and if they were getting behind we actually had to amortize catching them back up. Uh, that was pretty challenging um, but uh, luckily uh, channels uh, really helped in this scenario and um, we, got it, we got it working um, but it was very tricky. And the other thing that everybody runs into is time zones are hard. Um, it was a pain. We had auctions that were occurring uh, in ports all over the world. Uh, so knowing what port local time was uh, versus what time your user was in and figuring all of that out was hard. But another issue that was definitely uh, event sourcing related uh, was it was a kind of a problem of our own making. Uh, we were doing event sourcing, and we started to think, well, you know, command query uh, responsibility segregation is also something that a lot of people are, are using along with event sourcing. And so we started to go down that route. Um, but what we found was that it actually added a lot of complexity to our application. Um, and it wasn't something that we necessarily needed. Um, so what we ended up with was something more CQRS-like. Um, 
Martin Fowler has a really good talk uh, called Event Sourcing, um, called uh, The Many Meanings of Event Driven Architecture uh, that I recommend checking out. Uh, and in that, he says that in the past, where he's seen teams run into problems with event driven architectures is always in CQRS. So I would just caution you to really think about whether you really need to separate your reads and writes and whether you need that complexity. Um, so another um, set of issues that we experienced was something that we thought was going to be really easy with event sourcing was testing, right? So you can reconstruct your, the entire state of your application from these events and you can just you know, make some assertions and, and, and it did work out pretty well uh, where we could you know, uh, issue some commands and then make assertions on what the uh, events that were produced uh, were. Um, but one of the things that we kept running into and struggled a little bit with was when you have events getting generated and then anything could respond to that event, uh, sometimes that means interacting with the database. Um, and so we got a lot of these error messages, uh, which is the Ecto Sandbox um, telling us that, hey, I was using that connection, but your test was finished. Um, so we actually ended up having to really think about whether we needed to go to the database and uh, ended up in places where we could avoid it, um, storing state in either uh, just process state or ETS and uh, removing some of that where we could. And where we couldn't, we ended up having to write fakes for testing uh, and that worked out for the most part, but it was still, it was still a challenge. Um, those were some of the major problems we ran into, but what was almost more important was the problems we didn't have. Uh, we realized pretty early on uh, that we kind of lucked out a bit. Um, some of the quirks of our domain uh, actually allowed us to implement things in a more simple way. Uh, we didn't have to deal with multiple aggregates that needed to join events. Um, we didn't have to deal with uh, long-lived events and versioning. Uh, our, our auction state was short-lived. An auction starts, it uh, goes for a little while, it ends and goes into a decision period. And after the decision period is over and it closes, those events get hydrated into relational models and aren't necessarily that important to keep around. So we're able to avoid uh, versioning. Um, the other thing we didn't really need to worry about quite as much uh, about was scale. Um, at any given time, one auction um, had maybe 15 suppliers. Maybe there were two buyers uh, watching the auction. Um, and auctions lasted no more than a half hour to an hour. Uh, so we actually kind of lucked out a little bit there. Uh, it, we were having, running multiple auctions, but scale wasn't really one of our concerns. So this allowed us to end up with a much uh, simpler solution. So uh, the architecture that we ended up with um, looked a little like this. Um, we had a UI that would produce commands that uh, would get passed to our auction store uh, that uh, used a bid calculator module, uh, just a simple module to calculate what the state should be based on that command and produce any events that need to be produced. Uh, those get processed in the auctions uh, event store. And uh, if anything happens, the auction store can be reconstructed from the events in the event store. Uh, events get published over Phoenix PubSub. And we have various event handlers uh, that handle those events and maybe uh, talk to a notifier to update the channel that updates the user. So I'm going to walk a little bit through uh, some of the code. Um, commands uh, were pretty simple. Uh, we had a command module that had some functions that produced command structs. Uh, and in that struct, you had a command type and some data associated to it. Um, events, uh, also pretty, pretty similar. 
Uh, we have a pretty simple event module that has a struct associated to it. Events have a type, some data. Um, they're all tied to an auction ID. Uh, um, these are, anyway. Um, and then they have the time that they were entered, uh, which we found was really important, and uh, the user that was associated with that event. Um, and to emit an event, we just broadcast uh, with Phoenix PubSub. And um, you can see a couple uh, examples of auctions started, bid placed, um, but they just produce pretty simple structs that get emitted over um, Phoenix PubSub. Uh, our auction store uh, ended up being a pretty simple gym server. Um, we, uh, we have a single struct that defines our auctions, the internal state of the server. Uh, some client functions uh, that take commands and um, call a cast on the gen server. And then some handle cast functions that um, take the command um, type, perform what action it needs to do to transform the state, and then emit any events that need to go out. Um, so here you can see we're calling the um, auction bid calculator process, and then we're emitting. Um, so um, I talked a little bit about uh, how we're, we're emitting events, but how are we using them to rebuild state? Um, so rebuilding was pretty simple. We actually started with having each event have an apply function that took uh, the, the type of state that it was uh, being applied to, but it ended up, uh, we didn't really need it, so we just moved it back into the auction store because that was where it was getting called the most. So uh, replaying is simply uh, re reading the events in reverse order uh, and applying the appropriate function based on the event uh, and then returning the next state. And we just, on a net, uh, if the auction has events already associated with it, uh, we iterate over those and replay them. Uh, event handlers also ended up fairly simple. Um, we, on our init, it's a gen server that on a net subscribes to uh, the auction pub sub for the topic uh, that belongs to that auction, and then listens for the events it cares about. Uh, and uh, does whatever they need to do. Um, our event store, uh, it actually ended up really simple, um, and it's something that I thought was going to need to be complex, but so far uh, has been able to be pretty simple. So it's a gen server that, like the event uh, handler, subscribes to all events. And um, it takes the event in and uh, produces a auction event storage struct uh, and talks to our storage adapter and persists it. Um, so the um, storage actually is just an ecto schema. And um, Serialization was one thing that we, we kind of wrestled with a little bit, um, but we ended up actually storing our events as a binary column on our schema. And um, using um, binary to term and term to binary to serialize and deserialize that, uh, which ended up working out pretty well. Uh, mostly because our events were um, short-lived. So uh, I can give you a really quick demo of that. Okay. All right. So this is our application. I'll open up two Chrome tabs here. And here we have some pending auctions. Um, and we're logged in as a buyer on this side and a supplier on this side. Um, so we're gonna go in here as a buyer and uh, start 
uh, manually start the auction for Bodie McBoatface. Um, so we can see it starts off, there's a timer going, um, letting us know the auction is open. We can log in here uh, and log in as another supplier. And log in here as another supplier. And place some bids. So we can see we haven't bid on the auction. We're going to bid $100. And we can see that our bid was successfully processed and that we're the best offer. Come in here. Uh, this is a reverse auction, so suppliers are actually trying to give the buyer the best price. So it actually goes down. So we're going we're gonna to outbid them uh, and say that we can do $80. And now we can see that the best bid is $80, and you have uh, your bid is not the best offer. Um, so let's let's go in and um, let's crash the auction store and rebuild um, the state. So we can see that the um, auction store is live and has a PID. So let's go ahead and. Send it an exit message. So we can see that um, now that PID is not alive. Um, but if we come back here, place another bid, we can actually see that it is. And it's still, now we can find the new PID for it. And that's alive. So it's been restarted. Um, so how many seconds we have? Oh, it got extended. So one of the things that uh, happens uh, is that if you bid in the last three minutes, uh, there's an auction extension timer uh, that uh, occurs and ups it. So uh, hope, I was hoping that I could show the auction event log. Let's see if maybe I can do that anyway. Actually, I can't see the auction event log until it is ended. Um, okay. Well, we'll let that go for a second here. Um, yeah. All right. But uh, so th overall, I think the thing that I learned from this project was that it's really easy to overthink your problem when you're not thinking about it from the perspective of your domain. And that Elixir and Phoenix gives you a lot of tools out of the box to work in an invented architecture. And you should really think about, is this enough uh, for my problem? Um, like I said, our domain allowed us to simplify quite a bit because of the nature of it, uh, because the ephemeral um, nature of our events, uh, it, it allowed us to reduce complexity quite a bit. And to the point that we didn't actually end up using a library. Uh, there were some things that uh, I actually ended up uh, using um, that was inspired by Maestro. Uh, ordering events, uh, some, of, some of that ended up into the project, but for the most part, we were able to keep it pretty simple. Let's check in. Hey, OK, we're in decision. So this is the auction uh, event log. Um, and we can actually see now a history. The auction ended. The last bid that was placed was 75. We can actually see this is where the auction state was rebuilt because we crashed. Um, prior to that, there was a bid from Haley for 80. And prior to that, Tim built uh, bid 100. And then the auction started. And we had some uh, updated auction notifications that went out before that. And then the auction was created. So that was the application that we ended up making. Um,
And that's all I have. This is actually my new dog, Honey. We got her like four months ago, and uh, she's a 120 pound Mastiff uh, mix. Uh, we ended up taking her to the beach in St. Augustine because we uh, had planned the vacation before we got her. My wife's like, oh, we'll just bring her. What's the worst that could happen? It actually turned out really well. We drove 16 hours. She was the best, the best uh, passenger in the car. So <laughs> last year I showed cats, so I felt this year I should show more dogs. So um, do we have time for questions? All right. One there, one there. Thank you for your talk. Um, since you're running these auctions in gen servers, does that restrict you to running on a single server, or can you scale this to have multiple instances? We could. Currently, uh, the nature of the business is such that because these are really large transactions, they don't run a lot of auctions concurrently. They might have less than 100 running concurrent. Uh, and what we found uh, with some testing was that uh, we didn't really need to go into distributed. So we're, we're utilizing things like registry where we would have to rethink that. Uh, and yeah, if we, if we ended up distributing that, uh, we would probably need some of the um, uh, features that things like command would give you for routing uh, events a little more intelligently. So could we scale it? Yes, but it would take some work. Okay, thank you. About the event storming process that you mentioned at the beginning, sure. and how that sort of impacted your design. Sure. Uh, so, event storming is just the process of thinking about your domain and what are the things that occur uh, in your systems, um, and it's it's usually from the perspective of users, and it breaks things down into uh, events that occur and what the factual information is about that. Uh, but it separates out commands where uh, users are doing a thing and transforming state, uh, and then policies, like whenever this happens, whenever I see this event, you know, this needs to get incremented. Or, uh, and it was, it was really helpful to think from that perspective. We usually actually use uh, another um, design um, uh, called story mapping exercise that we do with clients. And that is really helpful, but it, it has a little different goal. But its goal is more like shared understanding about where the project is going, whereas event storming is very much um, understanding the specifics of your domain. Mm. So we didn't actually end up needing a state machine. Uh, so you're, you're saying you have a series of events that are coming in, you're handling them, but you want to make sure that what it's transforming is in a valid state? Um, yeah, sometimes I, I have an event, and based on some conditions in my context, I mm. have some reactions. Gotcha. So never, like always happen, but Gotcha. Okay. Um, we didn't end up having a lot of that problem. The way that we had things was handlers were simple gen servers that were matching the event. And then the logic for what it needed to do with that event was in a context module. Um, so depending on the context and some of the data in the event, we would decide what to do with it. Um, so I don't, I don't have any really good answers. I would look at uh, Maestro a little bit because it, it seems to have some of that, and Commanded is really full featured, so you might take some inspiration from this. Cool, thank you. Hi, you mentioned uh, event, I think event buses, and you went with Maestro, right? 
Uh, we actually didn't end up using Maestro, but we uh, took some inspiration from it. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And what's the difference between something like that and Phoenix to upset? Um, so I think actually Maestro might use Phoenix Pub Sub under the cover. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm wrong. Is it use? Okay. Can we, do we have another mic? <laughs> okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, I have one, one more question, totally unrelated. Um, I noticed in your slides, I saw something. It was a alias module underscore underscore module, and I was wondering what that was for. So if you have to access the name of your module inside of your code um, for whatever reason, then you can kind of cheat by saying alias center in your module. And then when you call your name, it does. Because I didn't be able to do that without aliasing it. OK. Yeah, it's a, there's no implicit alias. Hmm. Maybe earlier versions of Elixir. That might have been. Like this may have one. I don't know. Thank you for your talk. Um, you showed code where, or you showed how you were stopping the GAN server representing the auction and the bids. And I noticed there was a query run and it persisted straight into the database. And I'm curious to hear what's your experience. Is it better to store to persist data at the moment it arrives to make sure it never gets lost, or is it safe to do it when the GAN server exits? Uh. So we try, we try to do it when it arrives and not when it exits. Um, there is some stuff around timers that we have to do when it exits so that we can restart at the appropriate time. Um, but I would say if you can do that when you receive it. Um, one of the things that we did for the, uh, we're looking at doing for the cache is uh, when we receive the data, actually dropping it into ads uh, and using um, private so that you can have concurrent reads, but um, privileged writes. So, um, but yeah, I would say I would say definitely when you receive it. Uh, I think the reason that we got that in the log was it was actually querying it to reconstruct, and then when it reconstructs, we insert another event that says, "Hey, we're rebuilding the state." So that insert was that event. Uh, with the timer kind of off inside, do you have something that prevents a message that comes in after the timer stops yeah. from getting queue, or do you let it go in and then real quick when you process it? We actually stop it at the at the controller level, so. Uh, similar to that question, you talked about how the timer being able to put stuff directly in the store was a problem earlier on. Could you talk about how the timer worked in the new architecture? Yeah. Um. So right now, the way I'm having trouble getting my slides to cooperate, um, the way it works right now is that the timer actually produces commands that instead of before the issue was the timer was actually updating a separate process than our core aggregate or state. Uh, and so now the timer actually produces commands to the auction store. Uh, and then it gets processed. So we actually have a single um, synchronous point because it's really important that bids are processed <coughs> synchronously. So. all the way. <laughs> we should talk Just more. Just in general terms, how are you deploying this? Are you doing hot code swapping and that kind of thing? Uh, we're not doing hot code swapping yet. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, we're actually going to production um, soon. <laughs> There's a big trade show coming up. Uh, right now, we're actually using a service uh, called Nanobox uh, that mostly takes care of our staging instances. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, we're probably going to be moving off of that, though, for production um, onto, I think, DigitalOcean is the current 
also Ocean Connect and DigitalOcean seem like <laughs> they went well together. You know. Thank you. All right, thank you.